recording is on. All right, it's, uh, today is February uh, 14, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. Our agenda, we have three today. Uh, first one is how to free the chimp from self-incarceration. The second is uh, discuss the perspective, social relations, culture of hunter-gatherers, traditional societies, and bridge the gap to uh, the techno-fascist feudal perspective and a, surf, a silver surfing. That's vast. <laughs> yeah, different topics, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, there was also one from Gary though, about um, really bad conspiracy theories and how, you know, what conspiracy theories really are. Yeah, this, uh, that's that's kind of a vast subject. What, what do people want to tackle? Well, I, I, I kind of can't remember where we had left it the, the last time, the chimp um, place and the, and the other one is about, um, the other topic is about, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, just bridging the gap to hunter gatherer society because you know we live in a tech society, but yeah, the, what uh, we left the last time was was with the exercise. I, I asked you guys to try an exercise of just try to do something novel. Oh yes, yeah. that's when what you I actually, didn't tell you. Yeah, I found that. Did you do it? <laughs> yeah, I did it because I had time, and I meant very. I must confess to everybody in the group that. Every emotion that I went through that I tried to relate is <laughs> related to the the ape simiesque. <laughs> I couldn't find anything reptilian or mammalian, and it was all going back to more. So I'm a monkey, I just tell you. <laughs> Every emotion or everything that I, I just did, you know, exactly the connection. And I, I couldn't find the, well, it's, maybe it was the week that was in it, but uh, yeah. It was all to do oh, with so, well, that was connecting your emotions friends. to that was connecting your yeah. emotions to a yeah. certain layer of the brain. Uh, but, yeah. but why why did you associate them with a primate brain? But because they were I was no I noted them first the emotions with what they were, and then I, I tried to see where they were, you know, what was behind them and what they were related to, connected to. And they were all coming to um what I had gathered you were saying about the ape or the simian um, part of the brain or the list of the few I did. I didn't do it every day. I did it only a few times. And I couldn't find uh, the connections with anything reptilian or mammalian or maybe fish because of sometimes hunger and things like that. But that was not emotions. It was more feelings. Um, so that's my experience. Uh, I must... Um, uh, I, I, it was interesting uh, to do that. Um, yeah. Um, so, so what kind of things did you yeah. associate with with a primary? I don't have my. Like, I don't. Like I don't know, but it was. Yeah, the emotions were a lot to do with um, 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 need, um, the emotion, like the lack. I had written that on a piece of paper that I've left somewhere because I, I don't know what I'm doing with myself at the moment, but. Um, a lot of them had to do with uh, conviviality, touch, being with other, uh, associating, uh, um, play, uh, interact. You know, all these, that I, I mean, it was like, um, I, I would write the emotion as the thing, as the feeling would come. So I would, I would be saying like, uh, I feel, uh, I don't know, I must go and find this list. Start on you, and I might, I might get, I might get it. Uh, where did I put it? But I did little arrows from everywhere, and I tried to see was that generated from you know parts of our brain that were mammalian, no, uh, parts that were reptilian with you know reaction to danger, danger, fear, etc., no. And it, it most of it was part of things that have to do with the group and the. I don't know this, and, and there was play, and there was I was play feeling playful. I was feeling, um, do you know the, the the I don't know. Oh, it's very difficult to talk about so personal things like this. With uh, it's true that emotions aren't they? They very they're very intimate things. Um, but I did it. I did it honestly, and 
I'm going to do it again. I had a little piece of paper and I had written all the things every day, like, and I had done arrows and I, I, I've just lost it because there's been a lot of upheaval in my house the last few days. So, there you go. <laughs> so the, the idea is to get you to not personalize it. It's basically because it's not really yeah. your feelings, right? It's just a part of your brain. <laughs> it's it's yeah, a part of, part of yeah. your brain. So it's so uh, it's interesting. Why you why do you personalize? Why do you think it's personal? Yeah. You, oh no, 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 no! Because it's something. It's more an ex a thing that I was observing and that I was uh, experiencing when I was experiencing an emotion. I was writing down the name of the emotion, and then I was trying to relate it to to what part of my brain was this kind of corresponding with, you know? So I was, I, I took a stance of an observer. I was not, you know, I was observing um, what that was, but that's a bit like it was. But, but didn't you try and own it? If you, if you were embarrassed by it, you must have identified with it enough to feel guilty or feel like you own it or... Mm -hmm. Um, well, no, because I'm spending most of my time at the moment trying not to feel guilty, so I definitely didn't try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so, you know, no, no, it was like, oh, wow, this is, oh, that's, I was trying to be detached like an observer in a lab looking at an experiment, and, and I was the subject. Yeah. That's so, why I found that a lot of those, emotions that I was experiencing or feelings were definitely not uh, connected to mammalian um, layers that you describe as being to do with uh, the heart and, uh, and just little things like that and family and all that. It was, and it wasn't, um, there, there might have been some, some violence uh, at some stage, but I was wondering where that was coming from. Um, Although that's... <laughs> That's almost certainly reptilian brain, right? Yeah, that's, but that's so unconscious, isn't it? It's just so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did, did you notice who was watching? Did you notice, get any sense of a, the self that was actually observing these things while they were going on? Well, I was, pre I was, I was, um, I'm kind of used to do a bit of introspection. So I've been doing emotional literacy for a little while, not like you said. So I'm kind of, I don't know, I was kind of just uh, letting, um, putting a name on some kind of thing. And at a moment of the day, let's say, I would sit down and I would think, okay, when I was doing that, what did I feel? You know, if like, I don't know if I was, I don't know, anything I was doing. And I've tried to say, what did I feel then? And then I would put that the name of that emotion. And then after that, I would do your exercise, you, what you suggested, to, to try to associate that with, with, that's how I was doing it. Maybe I was doing it wrong, I don't know, but that- Yeah, no, it is anyway, good, anyway, it's good. But, so uh, it's interesting because if you writing down, what, if you're thinking back and writing down, that's what you were doing, right? Yeah, I, I was picking a moment, yeah. and I was, how was I feeling then? So, and I just, oh yeah, that would be, and behind that there was a few other ones. So I'd put the few other ones, it would be like a little mixture of different emotions, put a name on them. And then I tried to think rationally or whatever, yeah. you know, with what you told, told us about your theory of the layered brain. So I was thinking, where well, that would come from, would that be a reaction of a alien or a male? You know, and I, I kind of did that association. And at the end of the week, I looked at only a few, I didn't do many, I just did a few exercises and I, I, uh, that's what I was re reporting to you. I was saying, oh, that's funny because there was most connections were to do with um, that part of the of the brain. Um, that's maybe just a week like that was different. I think. Yeah, what, what I found, was, what I was honing in on is is the fact that yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of this is an exercise in your alien cortex, right? You, of you are rationalizing and thinking. Yeah, I know. And then writing down. <laughs> so it's your yeah, no, reporting on the the other the emotions that you felt in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, of course. But you you mentioned that the last time that anyway that sort of exercise is an alien cortex thing. But yeah, it uh, is. It, 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 it is. That's exactly what it's for. It's, uh, so 
you can objectivize the rest of uh, you know, is yeah. but is, it, is that would you think that is part of of um, maitrise? How do you say that in English? Control your alien cortex, or at least master it to, to well, use it in that. Way? Yeah, what, what, yeah, what, I mean, Alien Core definitely wants to get control of it. So the fact that you said, you know, it's kind of, you felt self conscious about uh, <laughs> talking about what the other layers were doing and feeling and stuff is that pure Alien Cortex. The Alien Cortex is identifying with those other layers, mm -hmm. personalizing them. And then basically feeling guilty or feeling ashamed or feeling embarrassed about them. That's that's pure alien culture. Mm. It's I just okay. found that kind of interesting. But what 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 I'd suggest trying next is to try and see it in the moment. So as you do uh, it, then observe. So um, it it takes quite an effort of memory to remember to do it. But, but if you say talking to somebody or a good way to to do it is if you catch yourself feeling a strong emotion or something like that. Yeah. And then just think, in the moment, I wonder what part of the brain is doing that. That's if you can catch yourself at the time when it's actually running. That's that's more valuable okay. than looking back in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of use for historical <laughs> revisionism right? because the moment. No, I know. No, past, right? Did anybody else uh, try to to do this? Did, did anybody else try to? I forgot about it, but I did have an event at work uh, or an incident, and I kind of did it um, in the same manner that you did, which was um, after the fact uh, examination. I have been rewatching the videos that Lord Hugh has, and I, you know, he, he there was the video on layered brain and this technique of analyzing and. Uh, where he played a clip of uh, two people kind of debating and um, matching uh, what one in one person was saying and what they were targeting, which part of the layered brain of the other person. So, so now I realize that you know it's probably just again my alien cortex um, um, examining because um, I did feel a sense of shame at how I reacted to something that happened at work. Um, but I was trying to match up what I was saying and what part of the layered brain it was coming from. So now I'll I'll just do something that I will try to observe in the moment because I'm gonna have a subsequent meeting with my supervisor and I'll try to observe the next time as things are happening. Yeah, in the moment is, is really the important thing. So that little clip that of those two people talking, that's uh, Jordan Peterson and Kathy um, Kathy Graham, is it? Anyway, she's that little little clip uh, is kind of famous or infamous, maybe. <laughs> and um, in some ways, I think that was one of the things that really launched Jordan Peterson was that was that little clip. He he became famous, I think, for testifying in court about. Uh, um, basically um, prescribed speech. They were going to pass a law for gender pronouns and you're forcing people to use the preferred gender pronouns to people in Canada. Oh, and thanks. Um, but yeah, oh, Kathy Graham, I think is her name. Yeah, so, and then he had, he got interviewed by Kathy Graham after that and then the internet just went wild after that little piece. Uh, one guy did a, did a video which just described it in superlative terms. Just you know, sometimes there's a glitch in the matrix, you know, kind of. And it was it was on that little piece. So I think that some people that watched it they got very upset. They got uh, I, I'm not sure if I should have used that piece now because I let, I think a lot of most people got lost in the politics and they didn't do what you were saying. They were, they were just thinking of Jordan Peterson and, and uh, gender politics and stuff. And that isn't what I was saying at all. But I know at least one person commented on that and said, um, uh, had the impression that I was using that to diss feminism or 
Kathy Graham saying, or, or take uh, the side of Jordan Peterson, which is not what I was trying to do at all. What I was trying to do was to get a highly charged political situation and get people to observe it neutrally. And it failed <laughs> kind of spectacularly because <laughs> people couldn't couldn't see beyond the politics and identification and stuff. And that's really what the whole exercise is for. So I kind of completely lost uh, what I was trying to do. And that was to try and liberate people from those kind of identity politics and all the issues which are are really um these these kind of intractable battles uh between the alien cortex and some kind of you know um really representing say the reptilian brain or in the in the case of the woman's part often a mammalian brain so they kind of act in cahoots the alien cortex and the um reptilian brain or the alien cortex and the mammalian brain and I think uh, the, the very first step towards new, you know, transhumanism and, and uh, not, well, transpersonalism more than transhumanism. Transhumanism is cyborgs and stuff. But um, in other words, transcending, gen you know, this politics and gender wars and, and things like that um, is is to actually observe and objectify those parts of the brain at the very time they, they're happening. And if people could just start to see themselves as, you know, hey, that's my mammalian brain talking and just observe it without interfering in it and, and changing it, that that's the real, real value of the exercise. And that's getting closer towards um, a kind of, uh, discovery of the observing self so that's that's what the whole thing was 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 really all about but yeah, yeah keep keep at it it's it's well worth it you see it's very hard i think to for people to even identify things like the alien cortex and so um i it, you know the 10 bull sequence in zen the bull really is your alien cortex and so the third panel is, you know, uh, actually the fourth panel is is um, oh seeing the bull. So, Sophie, you you sent that thing with uh, who um, was it Pink Floyd or something? I can't remember who that's the panel. Who who was it? Oh, you muted. Was it uh, Cat Stevens? <laughs> yeah, Cat Stevens. Yeah. So he made a clear reference in that the you know the fourth pa the panel uh, of the ten bull sequence to seeing the bull and that really is quite a big step is is at some point if you stick with this exercise at some point you you can uh especially in a quiet moment and when you might be talking to somebody especially if it's a boss or something like that um, or if somebody's having an argument, two people are having an argument in front of you, or better still, if you're having an argument with somebody, and if you can suddenly catch a glimpse of yourself and say, you know, you can suddenly see, uh, it all falls into place. You can see your alien cortex working, you can see the other person's alien cortex working, you can see the reptilian brain, brain flaring up, You can and you, can, you see this kind of comedy, this kind of zoo of interaction. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a very good place to get. <laughs> I found I found the list uh, that I had. Um, <laughs> this must not go out the group, <laughs> right? I, I'm going to give you a few names that I've. It's, it's not going to go any further than the. <laughs> We're being recorded, you know. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's very. I write very badly, so I've written lazy, impatient, giddy, fond. Uh, blessed, outraged, playful, rage, repugnance, and blessed, and I can't write the. I can't read. I can't even read myself. <laughs> Sometimes I write so bad. So, so some, these were just, you know, <laughs> something like repugnant is is yeah. is the the fish brain, right? It's basically right. it's around right. your spinal cord. Basically, right. okay. the structure is very deeply seated. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Rage. Um, 
Let, let me just repeat the alien cortex. So basically, alien cortex um, gets into a rage, but it's it's kind of a dual thing between reptilian brain and the alien cortex. So, so it, the the alien cortex uh, can be doing something intellectual, even like playing chess or having an argument, and it will send your reptilian brain into a fight response because it's basically saying it's in combat. And the reptilian brain takes the cue and makes it, you know, gives a flush of adrenaline and basically assumes that it's physical contact. Um, the operation was not directed at someone. It was, it was, uh, it was at um, at a religious thing. <laughs> I was outraged and I was in rage afterwards. A real like so. It wasn't a physical. It was that's why I thought, oh well, where's that coming from? And I thought, oh, it's because of control and. Control. I was thinking the group, and the group. I was thinking monkey, simiesque, ape, apian, ape kind of thing. So not maybe quite. not no. quite. Basically, because it's religion, it's ideology. So the alien cortex is full of ideology and ideas and simulations and stuff. So confronted mm. with religion, it's it's a conflicting idea, and so it's what the alien cortex is saying is this idea doesn't fit with my previous ideas and the rest of my ideology. So it's a, it's, it's a, a reaction of almost frustration, but then that that frustration then is, is triggering your reptilian brain. Okay, as if um, you know, basically a T Rex is standing in your path, because the older layers are evolved. You know, basically the evolution of what um, the reptilian brain had to deal with stopped somewhere around, you know, scaly lizards in your path. Mm. But then, uh, it didn't really alter all that much as these new evolutionary layers were stacked on top. Mm. So then uh, what happens is there's this conflict in, say, the modern world, which is modern is almost synonymous with um, alien cortex. So the alien cortex world is full of all of these cerebral activities like religion. But it translates into the old lizard world as, you know, some... There's an impact on you. <laughs> you know? So you get the alien cortex, which is, has a sense of ego, and then it might think, I'm a Protestant or I have some religious identification. Then you get an attack on this very abstract thing of Protestantism is it's very hard to, you know, put a fork in if you stick it on a table and poke with a stick. But, you know, people have a very clear idea of what a Protestant, for example, or some religious affiliation is in the in the alien cortex and so when you attack that personhood that that ego that translates into the reptilian brain as me the lizard <laughs> so each thing has a kind of sense of um of ego okay. and fantasy and it's it, the lizard is saying i'm having a personal attack because the lizard didn't have any intellectual apparatus so yeah. any attack on it is translated into something physical yeah so that's that's yeah, kind of yeah, the way yeah. it goes. Impatience, impatience. So in, impatience uh, as well is basically it's going to be the alien cortex because it's frustrated. So it it wants control, and it basically it's goal oriented. So so most things you know all the way down to like the fish brain were goal oriented in the sense of food or something like that. You know, trying to get food or sex or something that was. Um, uh, you know, a kind of a desire, but if if you frustrated normally these days, you're frustrated with you know because you're talking to the bank and <laughs> the help desk is keeping you on the line and stuff like that, and and so it's it's your alien cortex getting frustrated that it can't get control and can't uh, make headway. It's basically being obstructed, and so so then it's it's uh, you know can transfer to anger, but. Yeah, it's, it, in general, that's that's where it's coming coming from. Those things are usual, but it's good then to think about it in these ways and to think, you know, what what was the source of that frustration, and then try and figure it out in terms of this kind of world that I'm painting a picture of for you. But don't, you, you don't, you think, don't you think this this type of of exercise at the moment, like? Nearly all of us, I'd say, I don't know, but I presume the whole world is in lockdown and people are mostly self-isolating or at least taking very, having very little social interactions at the moment. And we're in a, 
you know, a period of a year nearly of adjusting to this. So I was wondering, I was wondering about how does this affect the different parts of our mind, of our brain, this new situation with the COVID where we are in something that we have never been brought up to experience and it also um, kind of, uh, you know, it's it, even the exercise in the light of lockdown, the lights of being not in a, in a able to, to join the group like you would join the group normally or, you know, have human interactions and, and touch and talk and laugh and dance or whatever people do usually. Um, could that not trigger certain parts of the brain, you know, more, I don't know. Well, no, it's a complete recipe for psychosis. So, they, <laughs> traditionally, they would put you in solitary confinement. Yeah. Um, and the, the reason, so the very Victorian thing was that they'd put you in solitary confinement with the Bible to basically consider your sins. It was an extreme form of torture because it would just drive you psychotic, especially with, <laughs> with the Bible. <laughs> and that is kind of what it was intended to do. It was really to, to uh, it's the same thing as I was talking about in the military where they put you in a double bind. And then that uh, putting yourself, two parts of yourself against each other is the essence of um, psychotic breakdown and, and ego breakdown. So what the Victorians were really doing in those, and, and still today in an American prison, if, if you go against the system and you show an ego or resistance, what they're doing in putting you in solitary confinement is punishing you, but it's it's deeper than that. It's cruel and unusual punishment because it's meant to drive you psychotic. It's meant to dis dissolve your ego. So you it making mush out of your brain, but the way it's doing it is pitting all these things against. Uh, it's basically you, you have each one of these layered, you know, parts of your brain that are are turned against each other. So what, what you see is, particularly in, say, American prisons, you have a lot of people cutting themselves and castrating themselves and doing that. Uh, it's very common. And the reason is that the alien cortex is, is being pitted against, say, your reptilian brain. And it's, it's trying to, you know, get control of it. The reptilian brain is like, I need to run. I need to get out of here. And the, the alien cortex is trying to suppress it. So what they, they're putting your own head in a cage fight by putting you in solitary confinement. A big mistake to do that to the population at large because basically people will genuinely go psychotic. And uh, we're talking male psychotic. It's not a bad thing to do is uh, if you remember what I said about you psychosis, because you need to break down the ego. We all need to break down the ego, but it needs to be kind of guided because you, you can seriously get you into real trouble in mal psychosis. There is just a kind of barking mad psychosis. Not all psychosis is constructive. So, you know, although you need to have a breakdown to have a breakthrough, you can just have a com uh, complete uh, dissociative breakdown that is never beneficial and you never really <laughs> recover from. And that's, that's what happens if people don't have any training, they don't have any direction, they don't have any reason for or purpose for being locked up so but if you have some spiritual goal or something like transcendence or enlightenment then yeah then it's it's very beneficial and that's why monks went into cells and monasteries and sat for hours looking at a wall if you if you went into an ashram and, and still today you can go to an ashram where they'll put you in front of a wall and you just basically meditate on a koan it's designed to make you go nuts but in a, the you psychotic way, it breaks down your ego, so your ego can't find any association. And that's pretty much what, what I'm giving you with this exercise. It really is going to make you psychotic. If there's anybody, any like psychiatrist or somebody watching this, they might go, shit, this guy is teaching these people really dangerous shit because they know what I'm doing. And that's basically causing, if you sit, and you dissociate that badly that you're sitting and talking to somebody and you're starting to think, and you know, hey, look at that guy. He's just talking about himself all the time. He's completely full of himself. I can see he's talking from his, his primate brain. You know, he's thinking in terms of status. And then a little kid walks up and, like, 
you know, pokes fun at him. And you can just see, oh, that, look, I see the primate brain. It, it, it's very enlightening to start off with. But after a while, I warn you in advance, but basically uh, it's, you get to a place where um, autistic people get to and psychotic people, uh, people with bipolar disorder, they get an undue uh, um, sense of, um, of awareness. So, so basically a lot, a, some of the text on say schizophrenia will say that basically schizophrenics are people that see too much. So what the, yeah, what the, so I'm giving you the tools so you can see more. It's kind of a mind expanding experience. But what, um, what in Western psychology, we've lost the tradition, the shamanistic tradition of people yeah. transcending themselves. So the idea is that, you know, you're just an ego and your ego slots nicely into some fucking station in this, uh, in this dystopia that we have. Um, or otherwise it slots into some military position or in somewhere in the hierarchy. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, they, psychiatrists and, and the Western psychiatric tradition has got to a point where they pull you back from that, from that sense of awareness and then just dull you down so that you can't, um, you just don't have enough energy. <laughs> you don't have enough spare capacity for any kind of self introspection or any kind of observation. So they just stop you seeing. So in other words, it's like what they're trying to do in the Zen traditions and the esoteric traditions are open your eyes. And then, you know, what happens today is people's eyes get a little bit open. They go, oh, my, my eyes hurt. I can't stand the light. They go running to a psychotherapist and the psychotherapist says, yeah, have all these drugs. <laughs> you can have Zoloft, they're all SSRIs. And what they do is they immediately shut your perception down again. So, uh, yeah, if, if we, you know, it's not really optional anymore to, to not be enlightened, right? If we carry on the way we are just bumping heads and just running around with egos and stuff, we definitely are going to go extinct. There's no question that we'll, we'll all go extinct and soon. So really it's kind of our last best hope that uh, people do start uh, becoming more aware. And part of that awareness is, is uh, the struggle against order. So it's all really a struggle against order and chaos. And um, the alien cortex uh, is trying to hold everything together. So if you take this gels completely with the macro political scene, because you take something like the Great Reset, and you take something like um, Klaus Schwab. He's an alien cortex. He wants control of the world. He's got this utopian vision. It's the same old vision that Hitler and everybody blow felt. He's just this kind of, um, you know, Bond character. But he, the reason why he's this Bond character is, is because he represents the alien cortex. And all the Bond characters, they did represent the alien cortex and this kind of mastermind and this vision. For, for everybody and the, that vision is order it, and so and the, the idea is that you know with order you have control with control you have this burning flame and the burning flame can burn forever because you know basically it's uh, we just fuel it forever because uh, nothing can blow it out there are no winds that can blow it out the winds of disorder can't blow it out and so that that's the one side of things which I would call psychotic, I mean, not so, um, uh, uh, basically um, sociopathic or otherwise um, psychopathic. But that, that yen for order and control is psychopathic. And then opposing that is what these kind of exercises will do, and that's basically make you disassociative and uh, create more disorder. But um, you have to basically go through each one of them. It's kind of like a journey through the, the valley of the shadow of death. You have to basically uh, do what the shamans were, were doing um, in those caves. They take you through all these archetypes of disorder and order, and really it is a psychic journey um, that basically leads you through transcending yourself as a as a person. 
But I, I don't think it's a thing. It's a thing that you should do too much on your own. Um, as you said earlier, um, sometimes you need to have guidance or someone. And I, I can, I can see what you mean. Like you could easily um, fall into something that wouldn't be good. Um, I think, I think if anybody's listening, like you know, these things have to be. So, so, okay, let's be clear now. You're not going to fall into anything good. That's what you're no, 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 good in a way. That okay, you're going to fall into absolute cauldron of fire. But that's well, great. You're, you're going to die. That is great. That, that, is, that is, I have, I've, that's clear. But what I mean is, there's some people who, as you explained a while ago, will suddenly go war and run back to even worse. For example, a psychiatrist or a priest. And, you know, and, uh, you know, you could you just sometimes I think that I don't know. Uh, that, that's the, the, the most of the challenge That's the danger. If, if you see what what happens is people start on this journey, then they blink and then they they they, um, uh, you know, retreat. You can't really stop that. Right. Basically, by, uh, People just have to do that. It's part of the, the jihad. It's part of the wrestling. But uh, it's it's what's really dangerous is for people to run to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or something like that because what they will do is they will, you know, re-entrench you in this kind of limbo, right? It's basically propped up by drugs and things like that. So... So what I say in my videos and stuff, and what's very important is, is you have to take a kind of leap of faith. And what that means is you have to push on through it. So basically it's, it's an effort of courage. Um, but the, the, the biggest danger is not that you'd go completely nuts or psychotic or something like you are going to be. <laughs> the, the biggest danger is that you pull back. And try and try to get out of that. So, so it's kind of like uh, you almost make the jump out of the plane, um, but then in the doorway you turn around and try and get back in the. Plane. It's like uh, bungee jumping. You know, I once did a bungee jump in Long, Long Beach, and the guy said, like, the most important thing is that if you you don't panic, they said, don't look down, because if you panic, you might turn around and try, 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 you know, abort the jump. <laughs> that's the most dangerous thing is that's where people get really fucked up. If, if anything goes wrong in a bungee jump, it's, it's because they bottle out and they try and go, ah, and they try to turn around and get back on the platform. And the same psychologically is you just have to go like, ah, fuck it, and just go and be, be reckless. So, so most people don't want to be reckless. They try and hold on to their ego and try to hold themselves together. And that effort of holding themselves together is what causes all the damage. Now, you can easily run to a conventional Western psychiatrist or, or psychotherapist or something, and th they will help you reconstruct your, your ego. It won't, it won't go well. But you see, what the shamans would do is they'd push you through all the way. So if you see, like, it's really a kind of thing like, you know, taking ayahuasca and stuff. And so the guys, you know, which, you know, it, in general, there's nothing really bad that can happen to you. It just feels like it. So if you take ayahuasca or something like that, then you, you feel like this is the worst thing known to man. You might have a really bad trip. And then they would just talk you down from that. And the the, the reason... You know, they can say anything or do anything. You'll be fine. <laughs> it, but, um, you know, basically, people people just think, oh, you know, now they say, okay, it's okay. And, you know, spirit guide is leading them. And then, then they go, oh, phew, that's okay. But you can know always you, it, would be, it would be fine eventually. But anyway, I'm, I'm just saying that... Um, just um, just kind of set, set an expectation because you raised the thing about people going psychotic in, in isolation. So now one thing, there is one thing which you can ground yourself at any stage. And that is the, the first exercise that I gave you 
which is basically that relaxation exercise. So, so if you, if you, um, so what can really screw you up is if you get stuck in your thoughts about what you're doing. So your alien cortex goes spinning around like a top. But if you, um, if you notice that and start to get a bit of vertigo, start to feel a bit queasy in the stomach, you can cut off those thoughts and immediately get grounded in, you know, in your senses. So feel your hearing and go outside, look at the sky and get connected with, um, with all the other senses. And so that's, that's the kind of uh, safety, um, safety belt that you've got is, uh, is, is that exercise to go back to that. Yeah. But it, uh, yeah, this, most people that are teaching any kind of esoteric stuff on the internet, they're teaching self-help stuff. And it's all like, this will make your life fantastic. Well, it's not, the stuff they're teaching you isn't going to do any more than what Coca-Cola says. It's basically, they're selling you a commercial product. And they're selling your own endorphins, and they're saying, well, making you spiritual, and you're helping you relax and be de-stressed. And, and it's all bullshit. It's the same commercial bullshit that's basically make it, making you feel that your life is shitty. So basically, you can't trust any of that self-help stuff. The, the thing is that it's not supposed to be nice. Everybody thinks, well, you know, I'm going to get involved in spirit, spirituality and spiritual development because then I'm going to have a, everything will go better for me. I'll have a pink halo around my head and basically nothing will go wrong in my life. Suddenly I'll get rich and people will like me and <laughs> they say, no, <laughs> the exact opposite. You're going to be fucked over. <laughs> fucked over to oblivion. You say, well, why would I do that? And you say, well, think of the opposite. You just stay a caged chimp all your life. It'll just always have this low-grade, shitty experience that never goes away and you never get free. So basically, it's um, eventually people go like, I can't take this anymore. I need liberation. And lockdown is, is good for that point of view. Because well, yeah, I think lockdown is a form of liberation. I, mean, I think lockdown is a form of liberation because like the French uh, writer Jean-Paul Sartre used to say, l'enfer, c'est les autres. Hell, it's the others. <laughs> you know, we used to... Hell is and, other people, yeah. yeah. well, hell is other people. Well, so yeah, I'm not yeah. talking personally, but I'm thinking that when I was going back to this, this exercise of the layered brain and the emotions as an association, I was thinking that in the light of where we are now, it's even, uh, it's, there's kind of a magnifying glass on all this now, because you're not, you're not exposed to the normal societal interactions and it's we're a bit like in a in the conditions of a lab experiment at a at an enormous scale and uh what you said about psychosis i understand very well for a lot of people but these type of exercises in the light of this are um, extremely magnified extremely magnified because yeah. everything is triggered yeah. everything the isolation the risk of death the disease, the, all the little things of everyday life. So whether it's reptilian fish, mammal, oh, the poor children die, or the uh, the ape, uh, the group is fractured. You can't groom each other. You know, all these things are completely falling uh, apart, kind of. Do you know what I mean? I also yeah. stimulated. But you see, what what everybody's trying to do is trying to ease the pain. And so they're missing a great opportunity that this provides. So if you go on the internet, they'll say, how do you know that you're getting quarantine fever or you're getting stir crazy and stuff like that? And then they give you all these exercises to help you. And you say, no, <laughs> if they knew more, what they'd be doing is they're saying like, you're feeling fucked up? Well, double down, man, because you need to feel more fucked up. You and the only danger is you're not feeling fucked up enough. And you go like, I can't take this anymore. Oh, yes, you can. You double down on that fucked upness. Have another two months of lockdown, you asshole. There. That's what the government should be doing. And if they did that, basically, after this, basically, it would be kind of like, you see, that, that, that cartoon that we did last year early on, where I said, like, COVID, I liberate. I wasn't kidding on that because basically I knew that if people are putting
this situation, it is liberational because they see everything for the first time, right? You, they can, they start to, it's the same thing that I was saying with this, the last exercise that I, I mentioned um, last Sunday was the exercise of seeing novelty, just doing so, something novel in your routine, which was the, the next exercise, but maybe we can talk about that. But the, it's the same. If, if you walk down the streets and you see people with masks on, it's, it's, it's a break from the routine and it forces you to re-examine stuff. So people started doing that. They started doing that in this kind of ephemeral way. In the first lockdown, they said like, you know, maybe we can go to something new where we spend time with the kids. And, the, and it's all rather, it's in the right direction. It's all kind of fake and rather brittle. It's still right in the you know, alien cortex. You've got to go all the way down to the brainstem before this would really work. Um, but, you know, it's kind of like if you get over the sugary thing and how we can, you know, reinvent the world post-COVID and you say like, yeah, okay, that's all in a sugar gone. It's like another another month of lockdown. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's like <laughs> eventually I'm going to punch the walls. It's like yeah, when you get to the stage where you're banging your head against the brick wall and stuff, and then then we're really getting somewhere. So it's it's basically you got to go right down to the the nitty gritty band. And so it be it would be good if we got there, um, because. It, it you know, that's exactly that's exactly my point. That's exactly what you what you're translating. Exactly what I what I was feeling at at, at the moment. Uh, you put it very very well there. Um, well, yeah. The biggest very, danger is just just like with enlightenment is turning back. So it's it's like lots of what wife you know in the in the Bible yeah. is, it, mm -hmm. is if you turn back you turn into a pillar of salt. And so that's that's the big danger, and it's kind of the danger with these lockdowns is is if they're not severe enough, and people go go back. Everybody wants to go back to normalcy. <laughs> so like, if people went back to normalcy, that's that's the worst outcome possible. Not only can you not, you can't unsee what you've seen during this this pandemic. You can't unsee the the capital riots. You can't unsee the the so much was exposed of authority figures in the world, you can't um, unsee this, what's been seen. So there's no way people can go back to, to normalcy. Even if, even, if the, even if the virus disappeared tomorrow, it's challenged everybody psychologically. We've embarked on a psychological journey that we can't really go back, back to. But that being said, if the lockdown ended too soon if the virus basically disappeared too quickly or something it would be a wasted opportunity people would try get back to to normal <laughs> and um and and the opportunity to change we, we do need a great reset we absolutely do need a great reset and people realize that we don't we don't need klaus schwab's <laughs> alien cortex reset for, for one thing, the, the thing with those kind of utopian resets is they're too shallow. So, so we need a fundamental, visceral, down to the spinal cord, fish brain, <laughs> every single one of the layers, down to the fish brain reset. And then that, that's, uh, yeah, that that's, that's, could be a complete game changer. It could be a black swan. But people really need to get to the, the end of their tether. And they might in this. You see, if, if you look at, say, a plague like in 1665, the plague year in London, those guys got right to the end of their tether. I mean, you're talking batshit crazy people. They just couldn't take it anymore. They ran and jumped in the Thames and they went. Routinely, people would just strip off their clothes and go running naked in the street. And they would just say, Okay, that's another one that's lost it. <laughs> they would go and burn themselves, and and, and they're but that's happening quietly, you know. but that's but that's happening quietly in our in our Western world. Um, the, yeah. the suicides and, of, and, and the riots and all. Uh, that. But you see, everybody yeah. thinks this is awful, and they're saying, "Well, not really. Actually, it's actually quite good." Um, from a psychological point of view. It's it's a it's a rebirth. So it's kind of like you don't you don't want to have an aborted birth. So vaccines and stuff. I don't think I think vaccines will make it worse. Actually, <laughs> no one going to why, but I think vaccines will make the 
the the virus uh, worse. I think I'm starting to think that that they they will um, they will create resistant strains. But I'm, I've been looking into that. But but I think uh, but I think that the the whole pandemic crisis will get a lot worse. I, I don't think the, the virus needs vaccines to get worse. I think they will spontaneously anyway. As long as people congregate in big numbers and continue to live in stupid big cities yeah. and, and interact in big yeah. supermarkets and take planes, the viruses will, will get more and more dangerous. It's yeah, only I do think we might, there's a good chance that we're adding, adding to it because I think we, we're breeding... We, well, it will we'll know shortly. It depends on the type of vaccine you're talking about, because one of them, yes, maybe they are the ones that are dif there's three different types of vaccines, so they're not yeah, well, they're, all they're, in the same way. There lot, are lots coming, but the yeah, I mean, it's a different topic. But the <laughs> the just quickly, the reason why I think it is is they're not really sure why vaccines, um, you know, breed resistant strains or don't breed resistant strains as much as um uh biotics and but there are various theories but there they seem to be like three major factors that that lends lend them to uh vaccines to be uh more effective at, at not uh breeding resistance and but all three factors i think are missing out of these out of this current um vaccine drive so yeah i think in particular i think that the Vaccines are too narrow, uh, according to the variants, and that that's one of the. <laughs> if if you get that wrong, you're in deep shit because you you're breeding resistant strains. And so, statistically, that means that you're going to enable the strains that are the strains that have mutated to circulate freely, yeah. and the other strains are, are going to be maybe eliminated by the vaccine, but the other ones will have a free a free run. Yeah, it's, it's basically a big breeding program for the worst, the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, we'll know uh, one of the, th for that to be the case, then al also the, the vaccines uh, don't stop tr transmissibility enough. So they basically yeah. only like 50 or so percent. I think the, the best figures that are coming in now that it stops transmission by about 50 percent. That's not enough, I don't think. No. So I think we, I think, <laughs> I think they're doing tremendous harm with, with these vaccines, mm -hmm. but, but harm physically but um we're in for a real doozy i think but but psychologically it it might be <laughs> it might be the saving of us if we can be saved it would be it, you know this could really be a blessing in in disguise but but anyway the reason why it would be a blessing is because it would make a psychological turning point but it has to be really really bad it has to be like a, a emotional purgation so people have to go through trauma and catharsis and i don't think we're, we're deep enough in it but anyway you can it all helps right well if you're talking about the stuff that we're talking about is spiritual progress and <laughs> enlightenment it's it this is the time to do it basically you've never had an easier time this is a gift <laughs> so, yeah. so um yeah it's, it's kind of like it would help if you chose it right it's, it helps if you like decide i've had it with the world and i'm going off into an ashram to find meaning to life that is a better way to do it but if you like if the ashram visits you and say look <laughs> you know, you, uh, that can work too it's like it's a lot of people that were thrown in prison or something and they they're forced to to cogitate uh and um you know for, for every thousand people that the victorians shoved into prison and were driven nuts uh there was probably at least one out of a thousand that actually uh reached enlightenment for the same experience so that it would have helped if they had have had uh shamans and stuff that could have helped people actually do that but anyway it's a it's it's a well-known thing i mean what i'm saying is not all that novel if you if you look in say uh v for vendetta it's not notice. I don't think people really notice it because it's not one of the big features of the movie. But the the Minkowski sisters are very smart because uh, if you remember in the end of the movie, um, Evie is put in prison and 
basically tortured and traumatized. And it turns out in the end, it is by V. And so basically he, they were saying in effect that that trauma is actually what liberates you. And then in the end, EV thanks him for, for doing that, you know, punishing her in that way. But it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's well known in all these tra traditions of, of this kind of Christ-like passion and pain that you have to go through for liberation. But what people, the dangerous thing is people do it literally and they go through the same passion and pain and it plays out in the physical world. And then it has a real horrible result, which is death <laughs> on literal. But it can play out figuratively and and worked out into death of your ego and then that's enlightenment right there so it's worthwhile that that this is happening it's not if if we needed if we needed anything at this juncture with where the climate is at and the methane dragon and where the earth is is just about uh in you know i think we did pass tipping points in 2020 but if we haven't, then we are going to be saved in the nick of time, or you know, at least a portion of people are. It'll need a psychological awakening because it is a psychological problem, and this is probably a pretty good um, candidate for actually saving us. Things like solar panels and clever engineering and stuff is, would be a disaster because they're psychologically shallow. Yeah, a, a, a deep transformation. Yeah, this pandemic could do it. <laughs> so, so, so look at maybe, maybe maybe we should revive the cartoon that we that was uh, created last year because I thought there was a great potential in that in that little tiny little thing. Um, now that the situation has evolved and that it's staying with us, it's not the novelty. Is not. I I think it was. I mean, we could work around it, but I, I thought that was a very, very good thing. I can't I, remember. I, so too. I, th I think it was before its time, but but yeah, um, yeah I think I think people people will see it, <laughs> if not now, very shortly. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. The the idea of liberating people by putting them in incarceration is very kind of 1984. Um, you know, new speak, but it it is actually correct. <laughs> it's it's a it's like um, aversion therapy. You know, basically, it's it's you know, if you want people to really get over uh, tech civilization, which is what we need to do, the best way is to sh you know shove it in their faces, <laughs> right? But you know, there is a there is a form of therapy um, that's used uh, very rarely because there's very few of them. To, to serious personality disorders, like, for example, a narcissistic personality disorder, which is a, a nearly irredeemable, uh, irremedi irremedial type of condition, and it's called cold therapy. And it's actually re-traumatizing the person. You cannot cure him, but you can make him have a, a kind of a, a normal life. And it's, it's based on that. It's based on actually traumatizing the, the patient. Uh, and it's it works. It's it's a uh, it, it's um, called cold therapy. It's it's actually really what it is because it's extremely hard, and it's the only thing that can work on these type of people. Yeah, they used to do these therapies before they just turned to pharmaceuticals. Basically, if you wound up in the snake pit or something in Bedlam, <laughs> they would do things like cold therapy. But but they, you can't use pharmaceuticals for personality disorders. You see, so that's why the, that that doesn't work. So it, it's, that's why those um, those methods have been have been uh, developed. Mm. But they don't do it anymore, right? That was that was. Oh a, yeah, a well, cold therapy is, is is actually a recent thing. It's um it's uh, re-traumatizing people with stress. That type of personality disorder can enable them to not be as destructive. They'll never be. Their core will never be uh, changed because it's things that happen at a very young age. But they can. They can uh, not end up by killing themselves or killing somebody around them or being too self-destructive, and they can have, they can focus on a on a on a on a, on a task that they like and without having too much problems. But it's the basic what 
What's interesting is that they're using exactly what you say. They, they're traumatizing them, re-traumatizing, re-traumatizing until the, the response, the response is different. The response is not, uh, I, anyway, it's not the subject of our talk, but it's- Oh, um, no, it is, very, I I, I'm kind of intrigued. So I, I, I think, think, they, I think they must be rediscovering this because they used to do this in the 1920s. And all right. I believe it's malpractice. <laughs> I didn't know that they were doing it. No, no, it's because it's um, it's it's done on one-to-one uh, -one, uh, therapy. It's not it's not something that's done in hospitals or anything. It's it's uh, along with a therapist. Uh, uh, you, you used to in mental hospitals. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you call it. Was done for other conditions. It was not done for that specific condition, which is narcissistic personality disorder which is a very special kind of, you know, there isn't only 1% of people who have that, I think, or less. So it's not something very less, I think. So, so it's not very, but it is that method. Uh, so, yeah, I have, I've got it right, haven't I, that aversion therapy is where you give somebody the oh, more, yeah. like to get, to get somebody yeah, off yeah. smoking or yeah. something, you make them smoke, you know, tech world. Recording is recording. So, uh, did I get that right? The aversion therapy is the one where you give yeah. people loads more of the thing that they basically addicted to. Yeah. Basically yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really all, all of these things are attempts. All of these um, psychiatric therapies and things from uh, the 1920s, basically pre the pharmaceutical revolution, was they were attempts to rewire people's brains. So they did glucose therapy and lobotomy and stuff like that, which they, where they, they really are attempts to radically just uh, re-alter people's brains. And then in, you know, with MK Ultra and those kind of things where they, they, they did LSD research, that was also the idea was that it could rewire people's brains. And I think LSD has, shows a lot of potential. I think they kind of, starting research and stuff again no, the, the, the cold therapy i'm talking about it's it's really re-traumatizing uh, uh, the person in a hostile you know non-nice environment and to recreate the origin of the original trauma and uh, it's it addresses extremely severe cases you know it's not something but it, it's it is used and it can it can stop them from <laughs> Getting worse. It's, the same, it's the same idea. It's just to get people to rewire the neurons. It's the same idea. Yeah. It's the same idea. Yeah. It, it goes back very far. I think um, uh, King George the Third was. Um, they did it to him. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the idea of um, traumatizing people to to cure them. It's basically it's 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 very old and well established all the way back to shamanic times. I think. I think that's what yeah. a lot of the things with ayahuasca and um, psychotropic drugs, mescaline and magic mushrooms and that, they, they are getting, I think it's, getting I think, out of a rat. Yeah. Right? I think it's because it's, it's based on the, uh, on the assumption that every mental illness is post-traumatic. And that is controversial, but um, uh, human life is post-traumatic. Being a, being a human is a, is a <laughs> growing up is a, so it's, um, yeah, that could be another it's subject of life. <laughs> it's about, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think where we, I mean, everybody's been traumatized by industrial society. And mm -hmm. I think most people just don't realize it. It's not, it's not obvious uh, to people because they have a normalcy bias and they, they taught that the majority is the correct thing, you know, go run with the herd. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole herd has gone nuts. I mean, every one of us is parking that. <laughs> and uh, we're not calibrated to, we calibrated to see that the exceptions are deviant and the norm is good. So then, you know, basically even a psychiatrist will say is like, well, this is not normal behavior. And it's like, well, normal behavior means that you intend, you, basically joining the psychotic cult that's going to snuff itself out. So I wouldn't say normal is desirable by any stretch of the imagination, but that's what we've convinced ourselves that the majority is normal. It's like not in this case. So the, I, the thing was shamans were, had the job of knocking people out of that rat. And, and so um, since shamans don't exist, odd people in that have been relegated. 
um, and suppressed by uh, alien cortex in this. There's a lot of yeah, well, people are selling themselves as shamans, and unfortunately, they're taking people on paths that, that are just absolutely it's desperate to see some people who are calling themselves shamans. There's, there's a few left, probably in Siberia and some very remote places of, of South America and some places like that. But other than that, you've got this kind of oh, booming of shamans everywhere. And just go oh, they're mainstream in, in South Africa, they're mainstream in Africa. Uh, they call witch doctors or sangomas, but they mainstream. The, the majority of medicine done in South Africa is done by sangomas, not by Western medical practitioners. So, but the 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 value of the shamans of traditional shamans was to, I think, get people out of a rut, and uh, basically, it's I think it's a counter reaction to psychopathy. So. Uh, it's kind yeah. of the balance for psychopathy. Yeah. So yeah. what our society has done is it's gone too rational, it's too psychotic. Um, no, no, I mean, um, uh, basically we have psychopaths leading us and we're, we are too, um, we're too rigid, we're too uh, alien cortex, and that's the psychopathy. And we've, we've lost the traditional antidote to that, which is shamanism. And I think that's why in the capital riot, it's, it's very deep psychologically what went on in the capital riot and from so many angles. I mean, it's it's symbolic from the point of view, just from the point of view as a capital is capitas is from your head. It's basically, it means the head. It is the capital dome. It's almost epitomizes the alien cortex. And so the, the, the fact that the capital bil building was rifled and um, and and that riot is is deeply significant psychologically. And there was a guy dressed like a sh pretending to be half shamanic. You remember that sort of? Well, the, the, I think that guy, <laughs> the, the German shaman. The reason yeah. the people were so fascinated by it is because they can recognize in folk memory what what's going on, and it is an exorcism. Basically, what that that um, Kuhn shaman, even the. Even the uh, the shallowest liberal that thought you know didn't think it was ridiculous, they they were kind of fascinated by it. You no, know, the fascination is that it, it has deep roots. Um, that uh, sh shamans are, according to Polymeni and uh, and a good Julian Silverman and these guys, they they uh, there's no difference between uh, schizophrenics and and shaman. And so the there's the shamanic explanation for schizophrenia. I think is a good one. And since schizophrenia runs in the population at a rate of about 1%, and is exactly the same as psychopathy is also 1%, and they're both genetic. So they assume, and they're very old, so they, they assume that they are, have some evolutionary purpose. And I think it's easy to see what the evolutionary purpose is. You do need psychotic people in, in, a, in a traumatizing or experience like a war or a disaster. You need people that are batshit crazy. It's like in war, in war times, you have people like Patton and that, but they're pure psychopaths. But they they come to the fore in time in those times, and I think that they have some beneficial survival value. Uh, when the war is finished, those people become a dire threat, and so then they need to be eliminated. And then the antidote to them is is the shaman. And so I think that's that's what we're seeing now. We we have a you know a world full of psychopaths and uh, shamans. I mean, like Roger Hallam is uh, fulfilling the, the shamanic role. So these shamans are coming out of the woodwork, and it's it's corrective. It's it's healthy. Hugely disturbing for people, but. You know, they all want to be on this little narrow little path, but that narrow little path now, everybody can see is even, even, you know, Klaus Schwab can see <laughs> that that narrow path is suicidal. So by the time an oaf like Klaus Schwab can see that uh, we're on the bad path enough to say we need a reset, it's like, you know, when a psychopath is telling you you need a big reset, <laughs> it's a great reset is like, yeah, you, you better believe it. And so, yeah. Anyway, for us in the meantime, the all of this is is hopefully useful 
<laughs> to you personally. Any anyway, shamans in the group? <laughs> what's that? I said, any shamans in the group? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fulfilling ah, yeah. the role. Yeah. yeah. What, what I'm doing is, is a shamanic role. Yeah. Shaman. It's, it's basically, I, do, I dispense with the horns and shit, but <laughs> yeah. There's uh, there's comments in the in the on the sidebar there, and um, I just have a question, or maybe maybe it can be for next time. But there seems to be a quote conspiracy theory unquote that the COVID nineteen disease pandemic is a planned one. Uh, based on going to the website of the World Economic Forum, where there's a page where the coronavirus is the center of all the strategies and the plans that will happen, um, and it's related to the Great Reset. So, well, just think, just thinking about that, the Great Reset, like you said, is very orderly, very planned, very alien cortexy. Um, you know, my initial thinking was, oh, this is so bad that if the COVID-19 is planned and it's going, it's the jumping point for pushing all these, for instance, the mRNA vaccine, which is uh, totally different from other types of vaccines. And I'm not a doctor or a biologist. Sophie would probably be able to put more um, information to us about that. But um, it's just to push ahead with the agenda, but but now I'm thinking that based on our discussion, perhaps the COVID-19 pandemic, as you say, is uh, not so bad in terms of the psychological um, breakthroughs that people may have, but still, and also I'm thinking that something that's planned so well like that, um, it seems like there are so many points where a weakness where it can it can collapse or not be implemented, or perhaps I'm just being naive because uh, people with uh, billions of dollars can can get this going really and you know transform us into cyborgs or whatever they want to do. Uh, that's just my comment. Yeah. Okay. Now you just opened the thing which we came in on, and that's what Gary raised, and so. Unfortunately, here's a good hour or two. Maybe next time. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe we must we must keep it for next time. But I can tell you my view on this is is um, yeah the yeah. Don't know how I can make it make it short, but there definitely are conspiracy theories. It's but they're not like people think. And I think it's kind of important I think, to explain my view of conspiracy theories. But yeah, the general thing is that we're in one of those dramatic times in, in human history. And what people get a bit hung up on in terms of conspiracy theories is, is seeing like 12 guys in pointy hats, you know, sitting around the table. Now, it, it's complicated by the fact that there, there are really guys like that. So there really are people like Bilderbergers and Skull and Bones and stuff that really throw, I think, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists off. Charles Schwab, when he got, um, he got presented, he got presented something, I can't remember what it was. but Do you mean Klaus, Klaus Schwab? Yeah, Klaus Schwab, he, he got, you know, the, the founder of the World Economic Forum. He he got presented the stuff in this freaking fucking occult regalia. <laughs> he was he's there on on tape. And so then everybody gets bent out of shape. But it's not it's not quite like people think. The first thing to know is that everything's a cult. Everything's a cult, right? We're in a cult. The mainstream society is a cult. QAnon is a cult. Um America, the Capitol building, is the founding father's cult. Everything is a cult. So the thing is that, you know, if you say, well, you know, oh, you're a nutcase because there aren't 12 people sitting around a table directly in the world. Well, you're thinking too small because 
if you've listened to what I've been saying, is the alien cortex is kind of like an archetype, and there's a meta-alien cortex. So you say, like, well, don't think of it like five guys sitting around a table. Just think, you know, they're, they're five energy companies. They're five, you know, food companies. So if you say, well, you, you're a mad conspiracy theorist to say that they get together. Well, yeah, they do. The banks get together. They get together. The Bank of International Settlements, these guys get together in Davos. And basically, it's it's the meta-alien cortex. So, so it's not like five individuals sitting around the table, but five corporations in law and never in psychology, they are entities in themselves. They are a single cult. They have personage in themselves. So you can get five big tech companies. And then those are the guys in the pointy hats. Those the, the It's not the directors or the CEOs of those. It's the company. The company, Apple or Amazon or something, as a collective, it is a Leviathan that is the equivalent of a conspiring person. And it's, it's, not, it's not that exotic because, like, you can go back just a little while where these guys, the big food companies, they were prosecuted for colluding to set the price of lysine. Well, that was in the 90s. They don't do that anymore because they collude with everything. Basically, if you've just seen the big tech companies, they monopolies, they just got together coordinating this program of censorship. So you say, well, well, you know, yeah, but it's not some cabal of guys sitting. Yes, it is. <laughs> they got together, re guys representing those big tech companies, and they said, this is what we're going to do. They coordinated it. So conspiracy just means conspire. It just means con together, and spy means, it's, it's from spiras, it basically means breathe together. So it's conspiracy means a group of people breathing together. And basically, people, people do that. They get together and they breathe together. They basically coordinate their actions. And that's happening everywhere. And it's happening in all dimensions. It's happening top down and left to right. You get together with your friends and conspire. I mean, every school kid is getting together with one lunch table, conspiring against them. And everybody says, oh, you got a tinfoil hat. <laughs> you think they're not? Everything's a conspiracy theory. It's like fish. You know, people can't see it because... Conspiracies are like water for a fish, and we all like fish swimming in these conspiracies. So that's the one thing. But then when they all come to a head at a dramatic time like this, you see all these coincidences that look far to um, far uh, beyond something that could just be a random coincidence. And then you get these synchronicities. You get these crashing synchronicities. What that means is not that the whole cabal of people that set this up, planned it, and executed it. What it means is even those people are actors in this play of archetypes. And so everything just gels in a way. If, if you get on those high points of psychic energy and transformation in, in humanity's history, all the archetypes, archetypes clash together. So even the main players like Klaus Schwab and stuff putting these things together, they almost swept along by the tide they're creating. And that's the way to see it is that, is that not somebody came and released COVID as part of the great re reset. It's just that kind of thinking converges to make that kind of outcome manifest. And the way it happens is, you know, you get China thinking we're going to, you know, have this kind of conspiracy to grow bigger, put a peg on the dollar, and build our power. You know, nobody can say that isn't a conspiracy. That's, <laughs> that's you know, you read in the newspaper. Then to do that, they start thinking in the way of somebody that, that, that is like that. What they do then is they start thinking, well, we need bioweapons research. We need to do this illegally. They start cutting corners in almost predictable ways. Then you get something like the Wuhan lab set up. And then basically it's doing bioweapons research. It's only a matter of a time because the same guys with the same thinking are thinking, well, we have to cut costs and basically the safety thing and we're going to steal the IP to, you know, set up a, you know, a, a safety lab, you know, safety level four lab and stuff like that. It's like, you know, they had to steal that technology. It's a whole mindset and you know where this is going to go and it's going to be a fucking accident. And then the accident happens and you say, well, this is too good to be true. But it's not really planned. It's just a vector that comes round from the whole set of thinking.
So you must think, you know, basically, when you're in, it's basically like the movie, Chinatown. It's like, and what they say, like, it's Chinatown, Jake, it's Chinatown. And what he's saying is, he's saying, like, that's what goes on in this territory. If you think this way, you do this stuff, and everything converges, and then it looks like, whoa, that looks like it was planned. And they say, no, it's basically, you know, if, if you keep on dancing on a wire, you're going to fall off the wire. <laughs> and the wire you fall off is the wire you chose to dance on. So all these things converge in this massive synchronicity. And it, it, it goes deeper than that, but I'll leave it at that just as, as a way to think about those conspiracies. It's not as if you could go now and figure out who who might be behind a big conspiracy like that, say, shoot them in the head and redirect history. It, it would be impossible for you to actually do that. The forces are so much bigger than those people, even the people that might have started it. So, yeah. So, but we must go deeper into this because it's, I think, I feel it's very important, especially at a time like this. Yeah. It, Thank it, you. It leads, it leads into Jungian archetypes and synchronicity. But we are in a very synchronous time. And these potential very, times in history are like that. That would be very interesting to go into. Really, it's, thank you. Yeah, it's thank like the, a Kairos convergence of all these um, things that have been happening in the background, coming together. It's a convergence of uh, Kairos and Kronos. So, you know, the saying is that every, every um, Kronos, uh, every, every Kairos has a Kronos, but not every Kronos has a Kairos. So what we're seeing now is all these threads of Kairos coming together. It's, it's, it's like a grand play, and, um, and these archetypes sync together. So very famous people that, that were at the convergence of these, um, of these great events in history, people like Churchill, they had far too many coincidences in their lives. Uh, it looks like a conspiracy, you know, for example, he always happened to be, Churchill always happened to be right at the point of history, almost where the spotlight was, wherever the newspapers were, wherever the, the great thing in that day, or right to the extent that he was in the gallery in New York at the crash of 1929. As the crash happened, there's Churchill standing in the gallery watching. And there's so, he almost, you know, walked <laughs> through history that way almost like Forrest Gump, you know, the Forrest Gump movie where he always manages to be at yeah. where America's attention is in history. And um, and Churchill did that. And it, I went, uh, I, I delved very deep into trying to understand how that happens. And I, I'll, I'll try and share it with you. But it's, um, it's, it's rather fascinating. We're at one of those times where, you know, basically, these all these events are bigger than the people that create them, even though you, you've got to be pretty sophomoric, you know, middling intellect, uh, conformist liberal to go like, oh, they're not conspiracy theories. Oh, you, what, you think people got together and say, yes, they did. But it, the whole, what you don't understand is that these events are much bigger than the people that are creating them. They're almost pawns in their the own tide. So Hitler was also one of those guys. They're very, very, yeah, and um, and Trump is also turning out to be one of them. <laughs> but all right, well, that's better do that for me. But, but if you want an exercise for this week, then I'd say um, just do the one, the same one we did last time. Of just try and catch yourself in something that you normally do habitually and force yourself to do something. And, and to do it just in the moment when it happens, not to think back, just to try to. No, not your one. So you were, right. you were the one before. What what I did what I did last time, maybe I can't remember if you were here or not, but yeah. but I said get at something that you do that's completely routine that you do all the time habitually. So in some of your regular behavior, like walking to the car every morning, you oh, yes, yes, in the car door and then You'll notice that you, you do it in the same road fashion with your eyes in the same place. And so you can force yourself to do something every Look over your back shoulder when you do it. When you I do, it, I do, that one. do something yeah. different, you know, basically put your head at a different angle, stretch your shoulders back, do anything that breaks the paradigm. So, so you make something that's habitual, just slightly novel, and go as nuts as you like. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Gary nailed that one straight away. He he realized the hidden the hidden intent in that. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You'll have to go back to the previous video if you want to know. Yeah, I yeah. last time, but I didn't pick up all that. I remember now. <laughs> okay, so let's do that one again, and then do this. Do the one you you were talking about of observing the layers as well. Yeah, yeah. And and if if it all goes badly wrong, anybody can contact me and say, "Oh, this is going really badly wrong." But if um, uh, your first first aid is to just do the grounding exercise. Yeah, the grounding. Mm -hmm. GS has some comments in the chat if you want to look. Um, yeah, I was looking at uh, going south. <laughs> He's in the London bus. Hi, Torsten. It's like. Torsten <laughs> yeah, is shamanish, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, I, yeah, Torsten. You should talk about your experience too. With there, there are conspiracies all the time, and um, so there, there are common or garden conspiracies like the tinfoil hat ones. But uh, and and they're conspiracies within conspiracies. Like they 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 will do psyops like like five G. They're well capable of of starting. Um, I don't want to say false flag. But <laughs> they are quite capable of starting a false flag psyops where they they will uh, do spurious things about five G or something like that. Just just a wacko theory about five G that no one can take seriously, and that's its aim, is so that they can say, "Oh, anybody that says in something about five G is a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist." They they they're quite capable of doing that reverse psychology. Yeah, that's a well-known technique, you know. No. Uh, but but yeah, most of the things that you know, like contrails and stuff like that, those those are those are kind of homegrown um, and nutty ones. But they they you know things like Area Fifty One and stuff. They did put out a lot of conspiracy theories about UFOs and stuff, and they did it to protect secret programs. There were real secret programs with real secret technology. So yeah, it's but anyway, it's, we ought to go into this because it's. I think the conspiracy theories are very important, and the and we've gone into the into this dumbass rut that liberals have largely got us into that like oh it's a conspiracy theory equals it's wrong it's like no if you think conspiracy theories are wrong you're just a dipshit <laughs> there are some conspiracy theories that are wrong but they're all conspiracies wall to wall all the time that you need to get in your head <laughs> okay yeah. um i i have a question oh, um yeah. If the do you think if the coronavirus happened thirty years ago, the Earth would be better off or worse off, or the same? I don't think it could have happened. You see, again, this is the kind of thing with the conspiracy theory. The things have its cars, and I don't see it could have happened. You see, one of the things that made this happen are convergence of a number of things. One of them is air travel. So up until the seventies, there wasn't enough air travel. If if they wanted to stop this. Um, pandemic straight away, the first thing to do is to ground all aircraft. That's a, just a basic thing. The fact that they're not doing it means they're murderers. But the, but there the wasn't enough personal air travel until recently, basically. what Where this has come from is, is really, and now people are going to get upset because you can't say anything bad about China because it's politically incorrect. But this is an inevitable result of since 2000, if you look at the number of people that started traveling in China, it went from like no one, or well, like one plane, <laughs> yeah. uh, Cathay Pacific, and then basically it, it got to a million people by about 2004, and then it got to fucking enormous numbers, like 500 million or something by, by about 2015. Mm -hmm. Now, any epidemiologist can tell you, you put that many people on planes jetting around the world, it's a pandemic's coming like tomorrow. Everybody goes, oh, Bill Gates is such a genius for predicting it. It's like, you'd have to be a moron not to see it coming. So so basically, the, you cannot get that many people 
the, these viruses are all over the place. There are millions of them. You, know? and you can't put that many people on a plane and fly them around and have this integrated economy without that happening. It's just suicidal. And so it was pure negligence on, on China's part. China has a lot to be responsible for, but you, you know, you can't really blame them because it's, okay, I, this is seriously good that this is in the long tail end of this video and no, but no one will see it, but you can't really blame China because they're stuck. Everybody's stuck. Like, you know, I keep on calling Xi Jinping a psychopath and stuff, and he's a psychopath, all right, but he, he's a stuck psychopath. He doesn't have any choices. There, there's not a lot, even, even if you're a fucking genius, if you stepped into Xi Jinping's shoes, you'd probably have to do exactly what he's doing. So, so it's, you can't single these guys out too much and say, oh, these guys are, you know, I, I mean, I, I will I'll make a sport out of it, but, but secretly <laughs> these guys are trapped they, they can't really do much so basically china had to industrialize like this they, they would have been in trouble anyway but it means that we all fucked anyway on that happy note <laughs> happy valentine's day <laughs> year of the ox Definitely year of the ox, basically. Yeah. Everyone gets castrated this year, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So much to think about. Lots to think All right. about. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, lots to think about. Thanks, Thank everyone. you very much. Everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice week. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye.